thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to first say a few words about my personal and professional involvement with the struggle of the JNU students. It was uh, late one evening that I got a phone call from a very close friend of mine whose name is uh, Jay Prakash and with whom I've worked for 30 years on the Bhopal gas, gas leak disaster. Uh, and he said to me that he had gone to the Patiala House Court uh, to attend the hearing, the bail hearing uh, of the Kanaya case and that he personally got beaten up. Uh, my first instinct as a lawyer and as a constitutional lawyer was to say that this was a complete denial of access to justice. And I worked overnight to file a petition by the next morning uh, in court uh, where uh, it was a very, very, very simple petition. If some of you have read it, you would know. All that I said in that petition was that uh, there can be no justice without access to justice. And uh, I demanded of the court uh, to let me know uh, what was the content of access to justice. And I said that, uh, at the very least, access to justice means that you don't get beaten up uh, on the journey from your destination to the courtroom. Uh, and that even if I had that kind of a guarantee, uh, that would kind of go a long way in ensuring access to justice. There are many other elements of access to justice, such as, for example, we've been talking a lot in the women's movement about witness protection, how to ensure that uh, a woman who's complaining of rape doesn't turn, quote unquote, hostile because she's approached during the hearing and compelled to change her statement. Uh, we all know that this happened in the Best Bakery case and the Zahira case, and that was also like a denial of access to justice. And ultimately, the Supreme Court of India was compelled to transfer the case out of the state of Gujarat to the to Mumbai for a completely fresh hearing. So what I said is let's just talk about access to justice. Now why was I so keen on talking about the issue of access to justice? Because I believe that the forms in which uh, we are oppressed are as significant as the substance of the oppression. And uh, it is my belief that form and substance impact each other. And uh, if we uh, abandon uh, the constitutional forms, in this case, the constitutional form would have been what we call due process of law. Like a day in and day out of our lives, we go to court and we talk about due process of law, which is, uh, which is the form in which justice is dispensed. It's not necessarily the content in which justice is dispensed. But the, but the issue is if you abandon the form in which justice is dispensed, you will simultaneously end up abandoning the substance of justice. And so I think it's very, very important uh, for me to make this point to you uh, in a forum in which I'm talking about uh, the Constitution of India and the various freedoms under the Constitution. So, of course, we know we have the freedom of speech, the freedom to associate, uh, the freedom to carry on our professions. I'll say a few more words about the freedom to carry out a profession a little later. Because I believe that my right to carry on my profession as a lawyer has been under very severe attack. And the reason, for, the reason is Substantively, I'm being questioned about the kind of cases which I've taken to court. Uh, Anand Grover, my partner, has been asked, why did you represent Raku Memon in court? And the mere fact of representation in a court of law of Yakub Memon has been pointed out as being quote-unquote anti-national. I have been asked, why do you support Tista Settlewad? Again, it goes to my right as a professional to represent uh, a particular person, no matter how unpopular that person might be in public perception. So I will say a few more words about this a little later, but today, uh, what is, and, and personally I have been attacked, but I'll talk about it a little later. What I would like to talk about today to you is political justice. And 
uh, you know, my what I've been thinking is that for the last 67 years since independence, we've talked a lot about social and economic justice. But somewhere I'm getting a feeling now, having regard to the current political situation, that we have not paid enough attention to the meaning of the expression political justice. And, and that is why I chose today not to focus on social and economic justice, not to focus on social and economic uh, freedoms, but to talk about political justice. Now, it's, it's rather obvious that we draw our inspiration from the preamble to the Constitution of India, which says that, in the li um, in the, in the, in that India is envisaged as a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic, and will secure to every citizen justice, social, economic, and political. So what I did is I chose to focus on the expression justice of a political nature. And the issue that ra it raised in my mind was, what is my understanding of political justice? W what are political rights as distinguished from social rights and economic rights? And this led me to, to, to reflect a little bit on some of the cases which I have argued uh, which I would like to comment upon uh, to, to, uh, to explain to you what is my understanding of political justice. So here's one of the cases which I argued very, very recently. Uh, it's known as the Rajbala case, and the decision was rendered only in December of 2015. Imagine how contemporary it is. What did this case do? It challenged a law passed by the state of Haryana, uh, which said that uh, unless you had a certain minimum education, number one, unless you owned a functioning toilet, and unless you had not paid all your dues to the electricity companies, you would lose your right to contest an election for the position of Sarpanch of a Panchayat. Now, to me, this uh, case presented a huge, big challenge to understand what is the meaning of political justice. And I asked myself the question, uh, where from uh, will I evolve the right to contest an election? And at the end of the day, what is the content of the right to contest an election? And I reached the conclusion that this was about my political rights. When I say my political rights, I mean the political rights about those who wanted to contest an election. And, and I posed the question to the court, tell me, if, as Dr. Ambedkar said, that we have achieved political independence in 1947, this is what he said, we have achieved political independence because each person counts for one. Why does each person count for one? Because we have the right to adult franchise guaranteed to us. And now if that is a fact, if we achieved political independence in 1947, then why are citizens being denied the right to contest for public office? Whether Denial of the right to contest for public office is not a denial of my political rights. My right to be counted as one. Because the right to contest flows from the right to vote. And the right to vote flows from my being a citizen of the country. So ultimately you're back to your citizenship rights. And your citizenship rights are your political rights. And this is the question that I raised in the court, that this is a blatant denial of the right to citizenship, the right to do politics, the right to seek public office, the right to contest for the position of a Sarpanch. Now, how did the court, I'd like to tell you how the court dealt with it because I find it kind of, kind of unbelievable. And uh, I was not able to make any logical sense of this judgment. Well, the court began by saying that the Constitution of India does not guarantee as a fundamental right the right to vote or the right to contest an election. Now, there you have it in black and white. 
It's for several years the Supreme Court of India has been telling us that the right to vote and the right to contest an election is not a fundamental right guaranteed under Chapter 3 of the Constitution. And therefore, although your other rights like freedom of speech, freedom of expression, uh, freedom to carry on business, etc., are all guaranteed under the Constitution uh, as fundamental rights, what is not guaranteed, we are told, is the right to vote and the right to contest an election. Now, you know, to any political scientist or to me or to a lawyer, this might come as a shock. And indeed, it did come as a shock to me. But the court reiterated this position and they said, no, uh, I, I even said, you know, I know that the court, Supreme Court has said that these are not fundamental rights, but I challenge you on that. And I say these judgments of the court are wrongly decided. And I want you to refer this question to a full bench of the court so that the whole question can be reconsidered. Do we or do we not have a fundamental right to cast a vote or to contest an election? Now, this request was declined on very technical grounds, on the ground that I was representing an intervener and not the petitioner. Now, be that as it may, one by one, I want to tell you how they dealt with each of these, uh, each of these um, disqualifications. The first of them was that unless you have a functioning toilet, you cannot contest for the position of a sarpanch. Now, here's what the court says in reply. Quote from the judgment. In a bid to discourage unhealthy practice, the state has evolved schemes to provide financial assistance to those who are economically or not in a position to construct a toilet. Full stop meaning they're giving us subsidies to con construct toilets. As rightly pointed out by the state of Haryana, if people, despite these subsidies, do not want to have a toilet, it is not because of their poverty, but because they lack the requisite will to have a toilet. There you have it in black and white. And uh, the court goes on to say, well, you know, it is our primary duty to keep hygiene and sanity. I hope all of you have understood the undertones of the Swachh Bharat national campaign under, underpinning this judgment. But it's in black and white and in a judgment of the Supreme Court. It's not a parcha of the government of India. It's a judgment delivered by the Supreme Court. And they say, well, it's your primary duty to maintain sanitation. And uh, those who aspire to be elected to civic bodies and administer uh, must set an example for others. In other words, you know, I must demonstrate to the electorate that, look, I go to the toilet in a toilet. And I don't go to the toilet on the roadside. Now, uh, so of course, uh, what this means is if we, the people of India, don't have toilets, it's not because we it's not because we don't have the money to construct one it's not because there is no functioning drainage system it's not because manu manual scavenging still exists in this country but it is because we do not have the will to shit and pee in a toilet this is the understanding of the supreme court of india no less we we tried to counter this point of view by presenting to the court uh, data relating to what percentage of the rural areas had functioning drainage systems, underground drainage systems. They don't have it. Uh, they, in, in the state of Haryana, there is a 70% of the households have open drainage facilities. So where is the hygiene in open drainage facilities? We really don't know. And there are other states in which this percentage is even higher of open drainage. Uh, we presented to the court data relating to manage, manual scavenging in this country. And we said, well, there are dry toilets uh, in, in the country, and there is still manual scavenging going on. And according to your own laws, manual scavenging is prohibited. But yet it's going on. Now tell me, would you prefer a, a dry toilet from which I have to get a manual scavenger to come and clean the toilet, carry the shit on their heads, or is it preferable for me to go and shit and pee in the forest? Which of the two is a more hygienic thing to do? None of these arguments were accepted, and the court just went on to say 
that, uh, well, you know, the state is going to be giving you uh, subsidies for building these toilets. So be content with the subsidy. I mean, where the water is going to come from, we really don't know. Uh, I even uh, presented to the court the level of homelessness uh, in the country. I gave them data that this is the number of people in the country who are homeless. And what will you tell them? If they don't own a home, uh, are, they, are they going to own a toilet uh, without a home? And uh, what are you going to say to them? And all that, there, were, there was no answers to any of these questions. And ultimately, I could only vent my anger after the judgment was rendered by writing an article which was published in The Wire in which I said the courts are the best ambassadors for Swachh Bharat. <laughs> now, uh, let me move on to the next issue that the court dealt with, and this was education. The, the disqualification relating to the absence of an education uh, uh, for contesting the position of Sarpanch. Now, once again, we had to point out to them that there weren't any primary schools in the country. They were introduced, the, the act was introduced only in 2010. And uh, many people couldn't afford to even go to a primary school. And uh, it, can you, it's the blaming the victim game. And are you therefore going to say that because they don't have an education, they can't contest an election? And, and uh, you know, of course, we presented the issue as one of discrimination, as an issue being uh, discriminating on the basis of socioeconomic status uh, against those who never had the opportunity to go to a school. We even gave them outstanding examples of people who didn't have a formal education, but who had reached the level of going and making presentations to the United Nations on issues of concern to them. We even said, well, what about, uh, how about adults' literacy as a substitute for a formal education? Now, none of these uh, arguments were accepted. And a law which says that unless you have a degree or a formal education up to the primary level or to the secondary level, you cannot contest an election to the position of Sarpanch. Now, the level of exclusion as a result of this judgment was approximately 35% of all people in the panchayat area stood excluded from the right to contest the election, 53% of all women and 24% of all men above the age of 20 who were literally illiterate and all of them stood completely disqualified from the right to contest the election and as a result when the election results were declared uh, we found that several of the seats went uncontested. Now, I also want to give you a quotation here from the judgment on what the court has to say about the relevance of education. Although I repeatedly said I am not disputing that education is relevant to every human being in this country, and I said every citizen of this country aspires for education. But it's one thing to have an aspiration to educate yourself. It's another thing to have the infrastructure to be able to get yourself educated. And they couldn't see the difference between the two. And here's what they said. I'm quoting. The object sought to be achieved cannot be said to be irrational or illegal or unconnected with the scheme or purpose of the Panchayat Act or the Constitution. It is only education which gives a human being the power to discriminate between right and wrong, good and bad. Now, at this point, I said to the court, let me give you a few examples of very, very highly educated people who have not been able to tell the difference between good and bad. And I gave the example of people like Raja who are being prosecuted for, uh, uh, in the 2G scam who is a highly qualified lawyer. He's gone way beyond primary education. And I said, do you think he had the power to discriminate between right and wrong? because he was so highly educated. None of this made any impact on the judges and they stood by their statement that education gives you the 
uh, ability to discriminate between right and wrong. And I said, I'm very sorry, but it's not education which gives you that ability. It's your moral compass which gives you that ability to distinguish between what is right and wrong. And it is your understanding of the Constitution of India which gives you that ability. Well, it didn't make any difference to them. Now, let's look at the third issue, payment of your debts. Now, here was a provision introduced to enable uh, private um, electricity distribution companies, DISCOMs, from recovering their dues. Now, we presented data to the court of the extent of rural indebtedness in this country. <laughs> and we said, look, it's people are not paying their dues, not because they don't want to pay their dues. I'm sorry to have to tell you, there is famine, there is drought, there is rural indebtedness, there are farmers committing suicide, and tell me how do you expect them to repay their debts? And are you going to impose upon them this penalty that if you don't pay your dues, you cannot contest for an election? Now, once again, this made no difference uh, to the judges. And, uh, and mind you, we even pointed out that even in places like Haryana, uh, it was companies that reliance that were supplying power to the rural areas. And basically, this provision was nothing more than a methodology of collecting your dues uh, to the private companies. And they said, uh, well, uh, nothing in the law prevents you, if you want to pay your dues, from uh, taking loans and paying off your dues. When the whole issue, to begin with, was the issue of rural indebtedness. And, uh, uh, of course, they said things like, uh, uh, I don't know whether they said the banks would give loans or whatever, I didn't look at that. But what they said is that, if you want to contest an election, you have to be a role model for others. And unless you pay your debts, you are not a role model for others. And so therefore, it's fine to have a law which says that unless you pay your dues, you can't contest an election. Now, once again, of course, at that time, we didn't have the famous Mr. Vijay Malia. But uh, indeed, if you look at uh, contemporary history, you'll find that people like Vijay Malia, till today, continue to be elected members of the Rajya Sabha and the, the volume of the debt they owe uh, to public sector banks is known to all of us. Uh, and not only that, but uh, if you look at the conflict of interest situations that you find your MPs and MLAs in, uh, Vijay Malia was sitting on a select committee of parliament on the issue of aviation. Then I had occasion to deal with another case of, and it was public knowledge, uh, of, a, of a minister who was, uh, who was himself uh, deeply engaged in the tobacco industry. And he was minister for that particular subject. So, you know, the, the irony of the conflict of interest that they are in uh, doesn't seem to, uh, to strike them. And uh, so I would, I would say, that uh, I would say that, you know, I, I really don't think uh, that uh, Dr. Ambedkar's, uh, uh, you know, statement that we have achieved political justice, I think, was a bit too ambitious at the time when it was made, because I think he, he probably thought that the moment you have a right to vote, you have achieved political justice. And I would say no. Now, all that I need to, uh, to point out to you is that we in India seem to be unique uh, in the world and not having these rights guaranteed in our constitution. And so, of course, I've been looking at other constitutions around the world, and I have found that in other constitutions around the world, these rights are very much guaranteed in their constitutions. Uh, maybe I'll just point you to just a couple of the constitutions. The most interesting of them is the Constitution of South Africa, and they have a separate chapter known as political rights. And as fundamental rights. And under this chapter are the following rights. Uh, political rights. Every citizen is free to make, listen carefully, political choices. I'm going to come back to the expression choices shortly. Political choices is free to make political choices which include the right to form a political party, to participate in activities, or to recruit members of a political party,
to campaign for a political party or cause. Every citizen has a right to free, fair and regular elections. Every adult citizen has a right to vote and the right to stand for public office. You know, surprisingly, a lot of this information came by way from a judgment of the court of Pakistan. And uh, it, was, uh, it was very striking for me that the, the, court, the, the High Court, the Supreme Court of Pakistan, reviewed the constitution of no less than 47 countries in the world and came to the conclusion that in none of them was education a necessary condition to contest an election, not even in Pakistan itself. And uh, they struck down this, uh, this law, which attempted to put uh, educational qualification on the right to contest. So, uh, what, what I come back to, uh, I come back to my topic for today uh, to say that uh, we we really need to focus our attention on political justice in this country, particularly in today's context. So let me now switch to today's context. And don't forget, the judgment I've read out to you is delivered in December of 2015. Hence, I would describe political justice at the very least to guarantee the right to vote, the right to contest for an election, the right to form a political party, the right to participate in political activities, uh, the right to hold a political opinion, uh, the right to espouse a political cause, uh, can it be, and therefore I come back to the student community, so can it be that simply because we as students don't have the right to hold a political opinion, we don't have a right, can, can we say then that students don't have a right to hold a political opinion or to participate in political activity, maybe of this kind, uh, such as holding a dharna or a demonstration or a meeting or to discuss, for example, the issue of the death penalty. So uh, I, I reject this idea that we don't have these rights. And I put them all under the category of our political rights. And uh, while I believe that the right to free speech is endangered in today's context, I feel that the right to hold a political opinion, which is different from that of the ruling party, is even more endangered. And, and that is why I think maybe when we're talking about the right to free speech, we should distinguish between these two rights, the right to free speech, which can be speech which supports the ruling party, but when it's speech which doesn't support the ruling party, then it becomes a different species of rights, and I would say this is a right to dissent from um, the opinions held by the political parties. Uh, now, of course, there are other ways in which political justice uh, is even more endangered. And that is, of course, suppressing political speech and political activity. So it's not just by denying you the right to vote or the right to contest that this right is denied. These rights can be subverted in many ways. As Dr. Ambedkar pointed out, it is possible to remain, come back to the theme of what does fidelity to the Constitution mean. And he did say, that it is possible to remain completely faithful to the letter of the Constitution and yet subvert the spirit of the Constitution. So that's another way of being, uh, I would say, being a traitor to the Constitution. You can remain completely faithful to the form of the Constitution and yet be a traitor to the spirit of the Constitution. We are seeing some such thing happening today. Uh, there is a manufactured debate on what it is to be national and what it is to be anti-national in an attempt to suppress freedom of expression, denying to us the very right to think. That is what is being denied to me, my right to think for myself, what is right and what is wrong, uh, what we wish to do and what we wish to do within the framework of this constitution. Uh, there is nothing subversive about demanding changes in the constitution. Indeed, I might want to inform you uh, that this constitution has been amended more than a hundred times uh, since it was drafted. And there is nothing subversive in demanding that the Indian constitution be changed to guarantee some of these rights and to include our political rights 
and for example to abolish the death penalty completely as being against article 21 of the constitution of india any attempt by us to challenge unconstitutional acts of the government is being considered by inference uh, uh, in, in, as an in now one more i will give you two examples of how this operates how our challenges are are presumably anti national or presumably unconstitutional i will take just two examples and stop there the first is the challenge to the a national judicial commission act where the government passed a law in which they would have had a role in the appointment of judges to the high court and supreme court now this law was challenged and i'm happy to say that perhaps the only good thing that the supreme court has done in the last one and a half to two years is that they struck down this law I don't know why. Whether they did it uh, because they were protecting their turf, uh, but it doesn't bother me. I'm happy with the outcome because I would have hated to see a judgment in which the government was given the right to interfere with what kind of judges have been appointed. Now, when this judgment was delivered, this was kind of the pet kind of uh, one of the first major programs of this NDA government. one of the first promises they made and one of the first laws they had passed and no less of of a of a constitutional amendment here's what the then finance minister arun jetli said and now i'm quoting him quote there is no principle in democracy anywhere in the world that institutions of democracy are to be saved from the elected i i beg to differ there are principles of democracy where institutions of democracy have to be saved from the elected themselves he says there's no principle of democracy where institutions of democracy are to be saved from themselves he goes on to say the indian uh, the indian democracy cannot be a tyrant of the unelected meaning that by the judges and if the elected are undermined democracy itself would be in danger so there you have it again in black and white that if we dare to unelect the elected by whatever means or to question their power what we are doing is subverting indian democracy and we are subverting the indian constitution these are his words and i do remember at that time i did ask him a question sir would you prefer to a uh, substitute the tyranny of the unelected with the tyranny of numbers what would you prefer what is your preference you know between the two tyrannies which is the tyranny that you would prefer though i don't agree that uh, judges by by giving this power to the judges we are perpetuating the tyranny of the unelected because that is a constitution under which we live and that is the time when we raised this question that mr jetley what are you doing are you undermining the constitution which says that our judges will not be elected and if that's what you're saying you want your judges elected please go ahead and amend the constitution and do it let's have a system in which judges are elected if you want that but so long as we have a constitution which says judges will not be elected and they will have the power to strike down laws let's have it that way now of course the second question the second example comes from the very recent uh, resolution of the bjp uh, at its executive committee meeting and again i'll read it nationalism national unity and integrity are an article of faith with the bjp remember not an article of faith with the constitution with the bjp now further a very microscopic minority you and me in this country it is today indulging in a kind of demagogy that goes against the very essence of our constitution i mean i would really like to know whether i have gone against the essence of the constitution today our constitution guarantees freedom of expression to every citizen but that freedom is enjoyable only within its framework talking of destruction of bharat can't be supported in the name of freedom of expression similarly refusal to hail bharat say bharat mata ki jai 
in the name of freedom is also unacceptable. Unacceptable to whom? To the Constitution of India or to the BJP? I'm not able to make out from this resolution. Our Constitution describes India as Bharat. Yes, it does. But that's a description and it stops at the description. Refusal to chant victory to Bharat tantamounts to disrespect to our Constitution itself. Bharat Mata Ki Jai is not merely a slogan. It was a mantra of inspiration to countless freedom fighters during the independence. And it remind you of the judgment of Pratibha Rani uh, when she granted bail, where she chanted the Bollywood tune. Uh, it is the heartbeat of a billion people today. It is the reiteration of our constitutional obligation where is this obligation? Is it in part three of the Constitution? As citizens, to uphold its primacy, the BJP wishes to make it clear that it will firmly oppose any attempt to disrespect Bharat and to weaken the unity and integrity of India. Close quote. Here again, we find an attempt to equate the majoritarian point of view with the vision of the Constitution itself. And any dissent from that view of the ruling party is considered anti-national. Notice again the reference to a minuscule minority. Never mind that the voices of this minuscule minority are demonized and distorted in this resolution. Uh, what is being said here is that no, there is no space in this country for a minority point of view, of a different view, of a dissenting view. Moreover, rights, political, social, are guaranteed to minorities as much as they are to majorities, and perhaps more so to ensure that democracy survives. So I would reject the interpretation of the Constitution placed by uh, the BJP in its resolution, and I would say uh, my fidelity to the Constitution does not include the vision of the BJP of the Constitution of India. Now, I would simply say that, uh, you know, this whole obsession with minuscule minorities seems to be shared by the judiciary as well. And I'm going to conclude by quoting from you something very similar said by the judiciary in the context of LGBT rights. So here's what the court said while rejecting the challenge to 377. Division bench of the High Court overlooked that a minuscule fraction of the country's population constitute lesbians, gay, bisexuals, and transgender. And in, in the last more than 150 years, less than 200 persons have been prosecuted. As but oh, so it's okay to prosecute 200 people, right? As far as I'm concerned, it's not okay, okay to prosecute even one. For committing offenses under 377 of the Indian Penal Code, and this cannot be made a sound basis for declaring the section ultra-virus the provisions of Article 14, 15, and 21 of the Constitution. I think these two statements echo each other, one by the BJP and the other by the court. And uh, they completely undermine the concept of minority rights guaranteed by the Constitution and do more damage to Indian democracy than anything else ever does. It, this constitution was made for this minuscule minority and, uh, for, 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 and it is the duty of the majority to respect the rights of that minority. Now, of course, we get back to Dr. Ambedkar, go round and round and come back to him. And he did say that it, what it means is uh, he talked about morality and he said constitutional morality means reverence for the forms of the constitution and forcing obedience to authority acting under and within the forms yet combined with the habit of open speech of action subject only to definite legal controls so everything that i have said uh, has has kind of in my opinion demonstrated that uh, in the current situation it is not only the substance of the Constitution which is being undermined, but also its very form. Um, I do believe that there is a lot of content in this statement of Dr. Ambedkar, and I think as a professional lawyer, I have also been wondering why I have been so obsessed with due process of law. I have sometimes not been able to understand my own obsessions, but ultimately I came to the conclusion that my obsession with the, the due process of law is a magnificent obsession, because it indeed 
captures the substance of the law within that form. You can't have a substance without a form. And it is due process of law which captures the substance of our rights. Uh, so um, I also believe that uh, this st statement has content because forms of accountability is what due process is all about. Are the means through which power is controlled. And it is the, these for, if these forms are subverted, then the content of our rights is subverted. Today, what we are seeing is the subversion and erosion, not only of the content of the Constitution, but also of its very form, leading to a complete abandonment of accountability to the people uh, of the ruling party and the government. Uh, so I would say, uh, you know, judging from my gray hair, all of you know that I've been here long enough to remember a few things that have happened in this country. So I'm just going to conclude by saying that in my own living memory, I have seen two moments in the history of this country which kind of mirror or parallel each other. And one was the emergency which was declared on the 26th of June, 1976. Which was an, it was an erosion of this form and substance of the Constitution, both. And the other, because it was done in the name of, quote unquote, internal disturbance. And today, we are seeing a parallel moment uh, where we see the subversion of the form and content of the Constitution and the abandonment of accountability in the name of nationalism and anti-nationalism. And uh, this is what I mean by saying that our political rights are a kind of endangered species. And now we need to, uh, for 67 years, we've been talking about our social and economic rights. I think it's now time for us to start focusing on our political rights. Thank you.